Rich Dad Poor Dad's Robert Kiyosaki says that he's $1.2 billion in debt because if I go under, the bank goes under. It's the bank's problem, not my problem. Hi, this is Tom Wheelwright. I'm the best-selling author of Tax-Free Wealth and the Win-Win Wealth Strategy. And I've been a wealth and tax strategist for over 40 years. And Robert Kiyosaki is a friend of mine. And uh, recently I saw a post on Reddit about Robert and his comments on debt. And it really brought to mind that there's a lot of misunderstanding about debt. And not just the simple, there's good debt and there's bad debt, but how does debt actually work? So I thought maybe it would be worthwhile in a short video just to run through how debt works, when it's good, and maybe even talk about a couple of different types of debt because Robert's type of debt is probably a little different than the debt that you might be familiar with. To begin with, I want to go back to my childhood when my mother taught me about compound interest. And compound interest basically says this, that if you leave your money in the bank and it's earning interest or you buy a bond or whatever, it's earning interest, and then you roll it over and you keep earning interest on the interest, you're compounding the interest. The effect of that is like doubling your money. So it's like two plus two equals four. In fact, there's a rule, you can look it up called the rule of 72. And basically the rule of 72 says that if you have a 10% rate of return, you should double your money every 7.2 years. That's the rule of 72. So let's say you've got that 10%, you can double your money. And most people would go, well, that's great. You can do more with that. In fact, every wealthy person outside of the Bitcoin billionaires, probably. Okay. But for the most part, the way wealthy people make their money is by using debt the right way. And the nice thing is, is once you understand it, it's available to everybody. I'm going to show you a very simple example of how you could actually do this in, in your own life. So if two plus two equals four, um, if you use your own money, what happens when you use debt? Well, when you use debt, you basically double effectively, you should be able to double that return. So two plus two equals eight. Now there is something you can do even better than that um, because the single biggest uh, expense any of us have and the single biggest drag on our wealth is not debt, it's not stock market, it's taxes. If you use debt and taxes together, two plus two can actually equal 16. So I'm gonna show you a very simple example. And this is an example that people have used over and over and over again. So people who say rich dad, poor dad has changed their life. This is what they've done. Fundamentally, this is what they've done. And it's really quite simple. So I'm going to use real estate in part because Robert uses real estate, but also because everybody, I think everybody uh, watching this understands something about real estate. And so we're, we're going to go ahead and use real estate as the example. Let's say, let's say that you have $20,000 to invest. You take this $20,000 and you invest it. And let's say that you get that 10% return, okay? 10%. So that's great. That means you would get $2,000 a year, right? On that money, $2,000. Now, let's say instead you decide you're gonna add debt. So you, instead of investing $20,000, you go out, you borrow $80,000 of debt, And now you invest $100,000. You invest $100,000, $80,000 of the bank's money and $20,000 of your money. And the bank's comfortable. They've looked at your, your financial statements, everything. They're comfortable. We're going to lend this money. Now what happens? Okay, well, let's say you get that 10%, right? So at 10%, That's 
well, wow, that's like five times as much as the $2,000 on my own money. That's amazing. Well, no, no, no. It's, 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 it is amazing. It's not that amazing. So here's what happens. Because remember, you have to pay interest. So let's say your interest rate on the bank's money is 7.5%. Okay, if you're paying seven and a half percent, then that means every year you're going to pay six thousand dollars. So what's your real return? Real return, the bank's return is six thousand dollars on their eighty thousand dollars, right? Your real return. is $4,000, which is twice as much as if you just used your own money at $2,000. So this is these numbers are actually possible right now because um, they, uh, the, the, the interest rate right now is right about 7.5%. And um, is there are there opportunities at 10%? I'm sure there are. So hard to find, but they're out there, okay? So, but this is the principle. All right, this is the principle. Understand, we're talking about principles right now. That's $4,000. Now, with taxes, we can actually make that better because if, if I buy this and I use it myself, I'm not getting any return, right? So this, I'm not talking about buying a house for yourself. I'm talking about buying a house for somebody else. In other words, a rental property. So in this case, you're buying this, you're renting it out, and the renter is paying you $10,000 a year, right, for use of that house or that condo, whatever that, that property is, all right? And that's how this is working. And you've got an interest-only loan, okay? We're assuming no principal's been paid down. But remember, if you do pay principal down, that's money back in your pocket. So it's not exactly like you're losing a lot there. Um, but we're just going to focus on the interest because that's really out of your pocket, all right? So interest only loan, we're going to fix it for five years. So we're, we're, we think it's going to go down. Interest rates go down five years. They probably will. And uh, historically they have. So um, we'll use that $6,000. Okay. With taxes, why, why do taxes make such a big difference? And this is not a, <laughs> this is not a video on tax. I'm a tax guy, but this is not a video on tax. What taxes do is we get a deduction on this called depreciation. And depreciation can offset other income. And that means that we pay less tax. Well, not only do we pay no tax on this $4,000, but we don't pay tax on our other income as well. And what we end up with is it actually ends up being a much better return. I'll do that in a separate video, okay? Let's focus on debt for right now. So we've got $4,000 here. You're going, but what, what, wait a minute. Robert says, it's the bank's problem, not my problem. If, if, if you default on that $80,000 loan, is the bank gonna come after you? And the answer is, it depends. You go, well, of course they're gonna come after me. It depends because there are two types of debt. The two types of debt are recourse recourse debt and the other one is called non-recourse debt what do those words mean well recourse debt is very simply that the bank has recourse against you personally and all your personal assets. So yes, they're going to come after you. And in mo in a lot of states, um, if you um, borrow on your house, then it is recourse. There are some states where if you borrow on a house, it's non-recourse. When you get into commercial property, so if you're at $1.2 billion, like Robert's talking about, you're, you're not talking about small amounts of debt, right? You're talking about large amounts of debt and you're talking about large properties. So in his case, I presume he's talking about multifamily real estate, like hundreds of units, um, thousands of units of apartment buildings. 
And so in that case, commercial, so this is typically um, what we'd call retail debt. This is what we would call commercial debt. Okay, doesn't it, it's not commercial because it's uh, it's um, commercial real estate something like that. It's commercial because it's bigger real estate. Think of it that way. Okay, and it's always real estate that is being leased or rented to somebody else. It's never personal use real estate. Um, we don't. I I rarely I don't ever see non recourse debt on personal real estate. Even if you're personally using your business, typically it's recourse. Non-recourse though, you get big, big enough, you get non-recourse debt. Here's what happens. You get a reputation with the bank. You, you borrow, the first couple of loans are probably recourse, but then you refinance and they say, well, you've been very successful. Um, we trust you. We're just going to, non-recourse means the only thing they can come after is the property that the debt relates to. So let's say you buy a 200 unit apartment building. Okay. So if you have recourse debt, let's say you paid $20 million for that. If you had recourse debt, then they'd come after you personally for the uh, 15, $16 million that you borrowed, right? So you're in big trouble. If you have non-recourse debt, all they can do is take the property back. So Robert's point is that if you have non-recourse debt, if you get big enough and you have non-recourse debt, then what happens is, is that the bank, all they can do is take the property back. Now, did Robert lose his initial investment? So in our example, would you still lose the $20,000? Yes. But if it's recourse debt, you would also lose the $80,000. The bank would come after you. If it's non-recourse debt, the you're going to lose your twenty thousand, but you lost that because it went down in value. But you you didn't lose the eighty thousand dollars. The bank lost the eighty thousand dollars. So in reality, it really is the bank's problem. Now, I'm not here to comment on whether this is a good system or a bad system. I'm wanting to explain to you what the system is and how it works. And you say, well, how can I use get to non-recourse debt? I will say it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. It's a simple principle. There are two things you have to look at. One is, are you a quality creditor? I mean, I, excuse me, a quality debtor. Are, do you have really, really, really good credit? And when you look at these big real estate developers and you look at um, uh, some of the big big um, real estate investment trusts and you look at uh, people who really do borrow a lot of money, they've been so successful to bank trust them. And the properties look so good. The numbers look so good. The bank goes, look, we'll take that risk. Now, the bank doesn't think there's much risk. But remember... The bank didn't think there was much risk in buying long-term treasury bonds at 2% with their depositors' money. And when the interest rates went up, what happened? Well, Silicon Valley Bank went under. Other banks were had to be bailed out. So you, you have these banks do get into trouble because there's a shift in the marketplace. So my point here is, can debt be bad? Yeah, absolutely. You do not want, I mean, if you don't know and understand real estate, don't be borrowing debt to buy the real estate. If you don't understand it, you have to understand it. Let me point out one more thing here because it'll really help, I think, solidify this idea of, you know, when do I use debt? And since we're talking about Robert and Rich Dad Poor Dad, let's go to a Rich Dad Poor Dad diagram. So this is a diagram that Robert uses over and over in Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And what is it? This is an income statement, income and expense. These are financial statements. And down here, these are assets and these are liabilities. So let's think about 
how income and expense, et cetera, works. Well, what happens most people, what happens is, is that their income comes in and it just goes out as an expense. That's called living hand to mouth, right? You, you're, you're always just covering your nut here. So what's, if you're in a business or you're in real estate, when you think about spending money, what's the purpose of that expense? Well, the purpose of an expense is to put money back in your pocket. Like if you spend money on marketing, it's to put money, it's to, it's to generate sales, right? If you um, spend money on a tax advisor, it's to it, it increase your income by reducing your expenses, right? So the purpose of an expense when, you, when you're an entrepreneur, when you're an investor, the purpose of an expense is to create income. What's the purpose of an asset? Well, the purpose of an asset is also to create income. Right now, it could also reduce an expense, but that has the same impact as because all it's all about cash flow, right? We're all, all trying to increase cash flow. So we're taking an asset to create income. What's the difference between an asset and an expense then? The only difference is an asset produces income over and over and over again. And an expense typically produces income just one time or for just one short period of time, right? So you do a, a Google AdWords campaign marketing, what's going to happen is you're going to get some income, but it, but you got to keep spending money. You got to put keep putting more expenses in there in order to keep generating the revenue. Whereas if you like buy an apartment building or you buy a single family home or a condo and you rent it to somebody, you don't, that, that keeps doing over and over and over again, right? That's an asset um, as opposed to an expense because it's not just creating income once, it's creating income over and over and over for a long period of time. Here's the question here, it's over here. What's the purpose of a liability? The purpose of a liability is to buy an asset. So when, when Robert's always talking about good debt and bad debt, when he's talking about good debt, he's talking about debt that, bar, that buys assets that puts money in your pocket. So why would we be afraid of debt? If debt, if the purpose of debt is to buy an asset and, and the asset puts money in our pocket, why would we be afraid of debt? And I'll tell you, it's very simple. If we're afraid of debt, it's because we don't trust the asset. If we're afraid of debt, it's because we don't trust the asset. Now, are there a lot of other risks besides our knowledge? Sure. Have, have really good real estate developers, for example, been hit hard by these raising interest rates? Absolutely. Um, have a lot of them come out just fine? Yep, they have. Because they really understood their asset, they understood their, their debt, and they trusted it, and they were knowledgeable about it. So again, don't do this. Don't use debt. If Honestly, don't even use credit card debt. Um, Susie Mar Orman's right. If, if you can't manage your spending, don't use credit card debt. If you have some bit of self-discipline, credit card's fine. Just know that when you use that credit card, you're spending money, right? That's the same thing as money coming out of your bank because you're going to have to pay that back. That is credit card debt is recourse debt, <laughs> okay? That is recourse debt. Most all consumer debt is recourse debt, meaning the bank can come back after you. So is it a two-edged sword? Can it be a two-edged sword debt? Yes. The reality is, can you make a lot of money using debt? Yes. And if you get really good at it, can you make it the bank's problem? The answer there is yes as well. So here's a couple of uh, the Reddit commentators. And uh, just keep in mind this video as you read this comment. Thanks.